thanks so many of you for commenting, for getting back to us, for watching Thomas's videos. Great material that he's coming out with. I mean, he's really, he's really hit a home run with this inscription on the Dome of the Rock. Listen, most of us have known about this. Murad, uh, I think a year ago, actually introduced this. That has been has gone over a hundred thousand views uh, when Murad introduced this idea that the person, the name Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock is not referring to the man Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, the Abbasid prophet of uh, Muhammad, but is referring to Jesus himself. And most of us heard that, we were excited by it, but we were still on the fence. And I brought Mel in here because uh, we, he got excited about this. He got excited about what Thomas did. Uh, I think it was just yesterday. And so we just put that up yesterday on looking at the inscriptions and looking in them in total, looking them in context, not just taking one phrase out and keeping it in isolation, but looking at the entire context. That's what you need to do with every one of these inscriptions. Thomas did a great job. But I noticed that Mel in the comments said I was 50-50%. I was not really the whole way. But now after this, seeing what Thomas has introduced using Christoph Luxemburg's translation of the Arabic, uh, I am now convinced that this is about Jesus Christ. But it goes beyond that because Mel has found something else. Being Mel, he's always investigating, he's always scratching. And the more he scratches, the more he finds, the more he finds, the more we, they whine, the more they whine, the more we shine. Oh, how sublime. This is typical Mel fair. He is great at uh, as, a, as a sleuth going back. He says, JJ, there's another phrase that we need to look at in these inscriptions. So Mel, it's so good to have you here. Uh, thanks for coming on board. This is an addendum, Mel, that we're going to now introduce to these good people. This is an addendum to what Thomas has just done. And we're going to do it quickly because it, we need to do it alongside it because we're looking at the same inscriptions. You found something else in those inscriptions Help us out here. What is it you found? We're all waiting with bated breath. And we're on, in my case, I'm even salivating. I'm so excited. What is it you found to help us out? Well, it, it, it fits in nicely with what Thomas has been saying for the last few videos. And I do want to compliment Thomas on all the fantastic work he's been doing over the last uh, set of videos. But he mentions quite a lot about the, the Syriac background to the Quran. And what was interesting is that I had seen a source for the Shahada uh, actually months ago. But what was interesting is that it was written in Syria. I didn't know where exactly. I just knew it was written in Greek and it was it was on my one of my files and I hadn't looked at it literally for months. And then I the penny dropped and I thought, oh I need to to go back to that. Okay. For those of you who don't know what Mel's talking about, the Shahada is the statement of faith. This is Laila Ilala, Muhammad Rasulullah. That's what every Muslim must say today. And that is what you do uh, when you become a Muslim, when you convert, you have to do Shahada. When you go to Mecca, if you want to get into Mecca, you have to say the Shahada at the borders. Uh, this is the statement of faith that defines who God is and who Muhammad is. Now, according to most scholars, not all scholars anymore, but most scholars believe the Shahada, the first reference to the Shahada is here on the Dome of the Rock. And we've, uh, I've, you've heard me say it many times. You've heard Mel say it many times. This is the earliest we know of any Shahada. We don't see a Shahada earlier than these inscriptions. So you're going to take that and you're going to say, hold on a minute there. We need to look at that more carefully. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think we need to go back 300 years to an area right next to, to, to Damascus. So we're talking just a stone's throw away. 300 years before, it's in the culture, and it's straight out of the Judeo-Christian polemics that were going on, and these are slogans from those polemics. So it's exactly in the same ballpark as what Thomas has been saying. So what I'm going to do now is share my slides with you. So this was the slide that uh, Thomas Alexander showed the other day, and the, the bit in red is the, the bit that I'd like us to focus on. There is no God but God alone. He has no associate. Now, if you ask most Muslims, even most non-Muslims, if you know where when did that first start, they would say seventh century on the Dome of the Rock. There was nothing like that before. However, there was something very like that before, and it came from Syria as well, as we'll see. So, where does it come from? So, according to Pines, this is uh, slow mo Pines. We can trace it back to a fourth century source written in Greek. 
way back in 1984, he said that la ila ila ala and la ila ila hua are translations into Arabic of slogans used in Judeo-Christian polemics during the previous centuries. Mm-hmm. A Greek form of the Tawhid exists in the pseudo clementine homilies, and in Greek it says hes, esten ho, theos, ke plen, otu, uk, esten. And in English that would be, God is one, there is no God except him. So you can see how close they are, mm-hmm. or how close it is, to the rock inscription. So let's have a look at it in context. So here it is in green. God is one. There is no God except him. We can, If we look at the first element in the rock inscription, there is no God but God alone. That is like the second element. Now, if we just reverse the pseudo-Clementine homilies, you can see how it parallels very closely. So there is no God except him. That's pretty much the same as there is no God but God alone. And the the second one from the pseudo-Clementine homilies, God is one. Well, another way of putting that, if you say God is one, is that there are no other gods. So God has no associate. Okay, so it's basically the equivalent. And you can imagine if this was a slogan that was used, you can you can say that slogan in in lots of different ways, but the idea is essentially the same. I don't know if you want to react, Jay, to that before I move on. This is fascinating. So really, this is this could be the antecedent. This could be where it's borrowed from. Uh, there is no God, but God could be alone. God, there is no God except him. God is one. Uh, obviously, this was a well-known phrase. It would have been all over that part of the world at that time, since that would they would have been speaking both in Greek and in Aramaic. And so it would be standard reason that Abdul Malik would use this since he he would know that it's no that it, it was so well known. Yeah. So these works existed in both Greek and Syriac. So if you think of the context of Syria, th- there were plenty of opportunities for people to know about these texts. These homilies were also translated to Syriac as evidenced by a manuscript from Edessa, British Museum, uh, addendum 1250, dated to the year 411 AD. So we have that in Syriac. And obviously, as we mentioned already, it was written earlier in Greek in the fourth century, about 100 years before that. Okay. Um, So we can also see some parallels between it and Islam's teaching. And I've taken this from um, a passage that I found on the internet. Strecker writes, just conduct on earth is the guarantee of a successful undergoing of the last judgment, you know, according to this uh, uh, (laughs) text. Belief plays a subordinate role. The death of Jesus has no religious significance. The Christological problem scarcely exists. The guarantor of the metaphysical notions is the true prophet whose call has to be proved by the coming true of his predictions. The basic document belongs to Sile, Syria, where it may come into existence in the middle of the third century. Uh, And uh, the the text that we have is from the fourth century. Um, So as we can see, there's the idea of that you get salvation through through your works which is a very common thing that you find in Islam. Not, not through grace, but through works. That's there in the, in the argument in this text. And the idea that what's important is a true prophet who proves himself through his predictions, through his prophecies. Okay. Um, another aspect is that it certainly was not widely disseminated and underwent a first revision at the hands of an Arian theologian the homilist, so notice there's a connection there with Arianism. Um, so it was mostly in that area. It didn't go f- too far beyond that particular sort of neck of the woods, as it were. His attitude to the Trinitarian question ties him down to the time before the Nicene Creed. So we can pretty much date when it uh, came from. It's probably to the first two decades of the fourth century. So we're talking from 300 to, say, 320 uh, AD. 
And again, it says he too may have written in Sile, Syria. So this is fascinating. Um, we can see that it's written in a particular location, a particular time, and it is um, a polemic to do with the debates about uh, Christology at that time, just before the Nicene Creed was formulated. Now, what's really interesting is Sile, Syria means hollow Syria, and uh, you can see the area on the map there. Um, the Latin is Sile, Syria, or Cava, Syria. In Greek, it is Kili, Syria, which I think was the originals, and, and then it got Latinized. It was a region of Syria in classical antiquity. It probably derived from the Aramaic word for all of the region of Syria, but it was most often applied to the Becca Valley between the Lebanon and the anti-Lebanon mountain ranges, which is here. Now, it's fascinating that this text was written there, right in the Valley of Becca. And obviously, the Valley of Becca appears in the Quran as well. So there's a, there's a good tie in there. And what's also interesting is the fact that Sile means hollow, and so does Maka. According to some people, they would say Maka means hollow as well. So there's a lot of interesting overlaps that we can spot there. And a document from centuries before and from the same region where Abdul al-Malik ruled, ruled. So we can see there the, the significance of the location. Um, so I would argue that it's, it's a very strong case there for saying that, that when Abdul al-Malik was putting the rock inscription in the Dome of the Rock, he simply just drew from slogans from the Christian um, polemics, the Judeo-Christian polemics, which were well known in that area for centuries. Um, so if we, if we see it in context on a map here, you can see that the pseudo Clementine homilies were way up there next to Damascus. Um, Abdul al-Malik seat of power was in Damascus. And then when he, when he came to putting the rock inscription on the Dome of the Rock, that's where he got his material from. That's what I would suggest. And I, I would agree with Pines here. Yeah. So basically what you're saying here, this is to, uh, the, even the shahada, this is the holy, this is the statement of faith for all Muslims. This is what they all go to. And this is what sets them, they say, apart from all Christians, because we Christians believe, they say, not us, we don't believe that, but Christians, they believe, we believe in three gods. And this monotheistic overlay that is rampant, whenever you see a Muslim putting their one finger up, this is the oneness of God. This is the tawhid, tawhid. Uh, the oneness of God. If that is the case, and this is so stringent, of course, this is right there introduced on the Dome of the Rock. As Muslims have been telling us, as scholars have been telling us, as we believe that this was introduced, that idea was introduced in the Dome of the Rock. You're saying, no, 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 no. This is another borrowing. This is Islam just borrows right, left, and center. Abdul Malik needed something to borrow. He needed this, this idea because he was certainly anti-Trinitarian. And what does he do? Well, he has already it there in his hands. I love the map you put up there because because it shows that this is this valley, this Bakka valley, that Muslims still claim today is a reference to Mecca in the Quran, because they only have one reference, chapter 48, verse 24. They need another, they look at Bakka. That valley actually is not too far from Damascus, where Abdul Malik was residing and where he was ruling from. Therefore, this homily that has existed since the fourth century, it had been there hundreds of years, in that same area, was easily accessible in both Syriac and in Greek, so therefore it's quite accessible to for him. It looks like that's why he put it in there. That's why he introduced it in there. Terrific stuff. Well, we're just nailing one nail after another, but I want to go one more thing. I want to go one step further. Even in that reference that you put up there, there, uh, if you go back to that one phrase, you notice it has, he has no associates. What's that about? That is not in the Shahada. In fact, why don't you put up that inscription again? Just show you, because I want to show you what line that is in, and then I want to show you where the last part, where there, and Muhammad is the prophet or of God. So there's the inscription there. Remember what you put up there, there's no God but God alone. He has no associate. That's an attack against Christianity, the monotheistic, the idea of monotheism in Christianity, because we they believe that we are the associators on the coins. It does attack the associators, and that's the reference that the anti-Trinitarians gave to those who were Trinitarians, like uh, like the Byzantines and the others in that area that were they, the, the majority in the church at that time. They were Trinitarians. 
Therefore, since they uh, elevate Jesus to the status of divinity, they are associating another with God. Chapter 5, verse 72 in the Quran attacks that idea. God has no partners. He has no associate. So they are the associate. That became a, known, a name for the Christians at that time. There you see it in the Shahada there. Is that in the Shahada today? No, it's not. It's not. So that is a deformed Shahada. But then where is Muhammad as the prophet of God? Immediately after that, which is part of the Shahada today, you have to come down three lines at the very bottom. Praise be the servant of God. Now, that word Muhammad that you can see there in the Arabic there, uh, Thomas has been very clear. This is what we've been talking about. That is praise be the servant of God. So not only have they taken one part of the Shahada, which is the second line, and then introduced this last line, three lines lower, to put the name Muhammad alongside it to make the Shahada that we have today, and suggesting that this was first introduced both on the coins and on the protocol calls and on the Dome of the Rock in 691 and 692. That is where they're saying that that is the first introduction, where it's obvious that this has nothing to do with that Shahada. This is a Shahada, as you're pointing out, that comes from the third century. It comes from the pseudo-Clementine homilies. On top of that, it's an attack, it's a polemic against the Christians who they believe are associators because they elevate Jesus to the status of God. They believe that. We don't believe that. And then in order to find this prophet that they need to get in there, they go down to the bottom line, and that which is referring to Jesus, praise be the servant of God, Jesus, who is the servant. He's nothing more than the servant of God. Again, and it is a polemic by Abdul Malik against the Christians. That is not a man named Muhammad, because in this case, they've taken ninth century meaning and they've introduced it onto a, a seventh century text. They've done that with a, a line number two. They've done that with line number four. That's not the only place they've done it. And this is where it's been fun, uh, Mel, because people write in our comments whenever the, we put up these videos, right? So I want you to go down and I want to introduce another comment uh, that was brought up. So here is the inscription. This is the inscription that, uh, that our good friend Thomas put up. And I want you to look at the word Islam. So go ahead, click it. There is the word Islam. The claim is this is the first reference to the religion Islam. Thus, Abdul Malik is the first to introduce this religion in 691. That's the claim I've heard. That's the claim probably you've heard, Mel. That's the claim I remember receiving when I was studying under Dr. Hotting there at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the 1990s. I had heard it even earlier when I was studying under Dr. Woodbury in California. So I do, I have always assumed that this is where Islam was introduced by Abdul Malik. And you can see it right there. But look at what, and look at the translation that Thomas has put up. Click it one more time. This word is the concord. The right interpretation of Scripture is with God, the concord. That, not the religion Islam, it's the concord. So this is where our comments are great. This is why I love to have comments because we get peer reviewed. And in this case, we were peer reviewed by someone named Faye. You know who this person is, don't you? I do, yes. I've spoken to her on a number of occasions. Okay, Faye is somebody that's been on your team. She's worked with you. She wrote this comment back yesterday after we put up this video after, uh, with Thomas confronting the word Muhammad there in the text. And she said, thank you, Thomas. Great work again. Regarding the word al-Islam, it is read al-Aslam, she's saying, meaning the word more correct or the one that agrees with God, someone who's in agreement with God. I can see how it was later used to sound like al-Islam to indicate that the religion that God agrees with uh, is, is Islam. Is this correct? But what Faye is saying here is that word al-Islam should be read as al-Aslam, which means more correct. So Thomas, being what he is, he read this same. In fact, I texted him real quickly. I said, Thomas, have you read what Faye has said? So Thomas said, let me look into it. So this is his response to that. Hello, Faye. I really like the way you're thinking. I think this sounds very plausible. I did take my time to respond because I wanted to double check with Luxembourg again. He does say it is al-Islam, but according to him, this is not a reference to a religion, but simply means something along the lines of conformity or agreement or concord. So he is saying something similar. The inscription says that the people of the book fell into disagreement and only the conformity agreement concord with scripture can save them. The conclusion then, 
Can you see what's, what Thomas is saying? Concluding what, what Thomas is uh, admitting from Faye's comment is, this is yet another example of taking a ninth century meaning of the word Islam, finding a reference to it in the inscriptions, and imposing that meaning onto the seventh century text when that was not what Abdul Malik even intended. He was not introducing a religion called Islam at this point. That word actually was introduced much, much later by the Abbasids. But once you read it using that narrative, once you look at everything from an Abbasid standpoint, everything you read in the 7th century is going to have that overlay, going to have that narrative. As How many times have we warned people about this, Mel? We warned people about the coins not doing this. We want Now we're warning them, don't do this to inscriptions. Yeah. Can I just uh, throw in a, a, a little bit on, on this? If we compare it with the word orthodox, which means right belief, that was used as an adjective to describe you know, a Christian who's in conformity. So, and then it became the name of a Christian denomination later. So I see this as kind of like a parallel there. But you can understand why many historians, and certainly not only Muslim historians, also secular historians, have quickly jumped on this and said, yes, this is where the word Islam comes from. It is first introduced this early. They need, they're trying, striving in every case to find anything that is Islamic in the seventh century. And uh, th that's why it's fascinating. We as sin sifters, we're taking every one of these references and we're putting it into the sift and what comes out below. What is the, what we're finding is everything that they're putting into the sift, what we're putting in the sift is a ninth century interpretation. We go back to the seventh century. It's a totally different interpretation. So Mel, go ahead and what would be your conclusions? Well, I think it's clear that Islam has borrowed heavily in every aspect. Um, and we can see the Tawheed has been borrowed from centuries before. Um, Abdul al-Malik only had to, to go a stone's throw away to get the, the slogans that he needed for the rock inscription. They're there in Greek. They're there in Syriac. Um, he could take his pick. He may have reversed the order of them, but essentially it's the same ideas. Um, and then we also have al Aslam being used later, not, not in Abdul al-Malik's time, but later during the Abbasid time is when it, it got uh, changed to the name of religion, when they needed a name to distinguish themselves from the outsiders. Um, so really, that the, you wouldn't expect the word Islam to be used as the name of a religion in the 7th century, because it's really only in the, the next century, the 8th century, that there is a sense of them seeing themselves as something different from the, the Christian denominations, I would say. Yep. And just as we would not call, uh, we would not introduce or impose a, a 21st century view onto a 7th century environment, we're always being careful not to do that. That's called good exegesis. I see Jesus does the opposite. You put your own interpretation onto a text that comes from a different author at a different time in a different place. This is called eisegesis. It looks like even the Western scholars have done that. They've been doing that unto the, you know, it's unfortunate. And that's why we need to get back to the original text. We need to go back and see what the author intended. And Abdul Malik, what he was intending, this is a polemic against the Trinitarians. There's no bones about it. Uh, he was not introducing a Shahada uh, that we now know today. He was not introducing a religion called Islam uh, that we know of today. And he was certainly not introducing a man named, named Muhammad. Uh, that we now know today. All three of these, the Shahada, Muhammad, and the religion are all in turn in, imposed onto that text when they should never have been. Uh, great stuff. Thanks so much, Jamel, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, thanks for uh, catching me and being able to use this as an addendum to support exactly what Thomas is saying. This is Mel and Jay, 4,000 miles apart. Well, actually, 3,000 miles apart with you. Over and out. Mm -hmm.